Okay, guys, so uh, this is where we're picking up on our DMP presentations for this course. And um, so when it comes to these presentations, um, having your object library and your breakout sheet is something you should have alongside any of the times you're watching any of these videos. Um, but in, you know, in particular, for sure, when we get to the second part where we look at message structure. So first of all, um, before you even start these videos, there's, I guess you could say, some prerequisites. And I would say that's your Triangle Microworks videos. under protocol training. The DNP 3 videos 1 and 2. So you should um, have reviewed and gone back to those videos um, and gone through them from start to finish before you actually even start on this. It's a great uh, kind of overview at a uh, basic level to prepare you to understand what we're doing here. So when I publish these videos, I'm going to have a, a DMP3 part one and a DMP3 part two. And in part one, I'm going to look at essentially an overview of the protocol I'm going to look at um, data objects. And then I'm going to look at communications or polling schemes. Okay, now in part two, it's really going to be all about the message structure. What does a DMP message look like for a request and a response message? And uh, what are all the components or layers that make up that message and how can we interpret those? And this is where for sure you're going to need your breakout sheet and your object library. Okay, so that's what we have planned here in terms of um, going forth with, with these two presentations. Okay, so first of all, at this uh, point in the course, I usually kind of bring up a, a little bit of a overview of where DMP, um, how it fits into the bigger picture. And, um, and so remember, uh, we said DMP is a true SCADA protocol. So DMP3 is and uh, we said that when it came to Modbus, um, even though Modbus is a industrial network protocol, it wasn't really made for uh, maximizing the efficiency of communications in a wide area network. And one of the things we know about a SCADA network is it's for sure uh, wide area network. A wide area network and it covers a large geographical area. And so that's one thing about um, a SCADA network. It's, it's, it's always monitoring and controlling smaller processes within a large process. So you can think of things like electrical grid, wastewater treatment, water treatment, 
gas pipeline and distribution this trip etc so when it comes to the the SCADA network it it needs to monitor smaller processes within a bigger process so you can think of everything that's going on with our um, electrical utilities all connecting to our electrical grid and how ASO is um, overseeing all of those utilities and um, and monitoring their smaller processes that are part of a much bigger process our, our whole provincial grid and when it comes to the utilities themselves they're going to kind of have the same thing they're going to have a central office that's monitoring all their substations their transmission and their generation and um, and each central office for the utility is looking at monitoring each one of those smaller processes at each one of those remote locations so when we look at um, uh, networks really have been around for for decades but they certainly have evolved and uh, if we go back only a few decades um, back in the day all of this was accomplished by essentially a central office where you had your head engineers and you had your lead operators monitoring everything that was going out in the field as smaller processes so we're just going to call these slaves or servers and we're going to say this is the master and this could all be located over a 300 kilometer 300 square kilometer distance but they're all smaller processes going on at each one of these uh, remote sites think of them as say substations but at the central office where the head engineers and lead operators are they need to know the real-time values of variables in the smaller processes and back in the day that was simply done by making a phone call and these um, these slave sites these server sites these substations were manned 24 7 around the clock and the operators were recording data in logbooks and spreadsheets and doing it all by hand by um, walking around the remote site and um, and recording values so they would have tables with values of current voltage um, you know you carry on with uh, phase angle things like that they were looking at instruments where they were recording all these values in tables or in logs and then it would be um, basically by a phone call that <clears throat> the master would phone the man operating um, that station and collect data from his his logging of of values and 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 in turn the um, the people at those remote locations would call back when there was an alarm or something that they wanted to bring uh, back to the attention of the of the main or the head engineers of the lead operators and so <clears throat> back in and that day there was still a communications network set up but it was essentially set up as a, a regular um, calling of each one of these locations to um, report values 
um, within their logs or their tables so that the head engineers could look at trends and things like that and see how say current values are changing over time and whether there's dips or valleys that are causing um, changes to the system and so on and and what they're looking at doing is looking at all the generation transmission and uh, distribution values. So they're looking at all those values and then they're making you know decisions about bringing on more generation, load shedding and doing whatever they need to do to make the overall larger process operate properly by um, changing values, controlling values, or making adjustments in the smaller processes. So that's really um, what we have going on initially in terms of um, decades back, how, how this all kind of came about and how this evolved. So um, as each one of these remote locations evolved, they started to become more automated, smarter, so that you didn't require um, a remote site to be manned 24-7 with operators. So there was more um, intelligent equipment, uh, IEDs, started coming into um, these remote sites. And, and when they did, then um, communications protocols within the sites to give you a local area network made up of a master and a slave and say a Modbus connection meant there was communications going on in, in each one of these sites. When it comes to a SCADA network guys it's really about um, a, a central office um, where we have our head engineers, lead operators um, wanting to get a bigger picture of the uh, larger process that's going on over a, um, a wide area. So we have a wide area network here and just as an example I said 300 square kilometers and the central office is um, wanting to make responsible decisions as far as the, 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 the bigger picture process or the larger process based on data that it receives from each one of the smaller processes at these server or at these slave sites. So these are all slaves within the network. And so um, back in the old days, we don't have to go that far back, in um, just a few decades, this was all done by calling on uh, the operators at each one of these um, slave sites by telephone and collecting the data that they've collected at each site by manually writing into logs and recording values and taking instrument readings and so on and reporting back by telephone to uh, to the central office where the head engineers or the lead operators can um, can make good choices about the whole process um, that's going on over this uh, wide wide area network or this large geographical area and alarms you could say or any um, any values that were alarming um, could be reported back by those manned sites um, during a 24-hour period should anything come up they could make a an alarm report back to the um, the central office of values that were were beyond certain thresholds or limits of where um, the head engineers or lead operators need to, to know about it. So essentially as things progressed each one of these server sites or the slave sites um, became uh, more intelligent and we had more IEDs in each one of those um, smaller processes in each one of those slave locations and the processes became more automated and the communications um, within each one of the sites uh, developed and and um, and progressed and improved 
And so we had within each one of the sites, we had master slave networks. like Modbus, where within each site itself, it became less necessary to have it manned 24 hours, 365 days a year. And we could have, say, one operator just going around to each one of the sites, one by one, collecting um, the data from multiple sites, from the automated equipment and its data logging and its um, its its automated uh, data collection and um, report it back as several sites and you can see how things started to develop and evolve now this is where really DMP3 comes in because DMP3 now meant that this whole process could be monitored um, across 300 square kilometers uh, just by communicating with the RTUs at each one of the sites. And instead of uh, a man collecting data and, um, and operating disconnects and breakers and things of that nature, we now had an RTU on, on site at each one where when communicating with the central office, the um, the head engineers and lead operators are able to collect data and control uh, smart devices interfacing through to the um, server equipment or the substation equipment through the RTU. So um, this is where DMP addressed the efficiency of this whole system. And back in the day when this first started, um, all the utilities would have to pay for expensive uh, data connections to each one of these sites and when they did um, the how much they used them and and how much how they leveraged the da data or the bandwidth they had available to them was was really important and because it was of such high importance because the head engineers or the lead operators wanted to have a real-time snapshot or picture of what was going on in the field. The um, efficiency of the communications protocol that was gathering um, all the data and controlling it was of utmost importance. And that's where the true SCADA protocol, DMP, came in as a, um, as a solution because it was very efficient with its use of those data connections and things like that. Now, nowadays I sort of think that DMP is maybe not as, uh, maybe not used as much as, as um, it originally was because um, with today's high speed data connections and um, and how inexpensive they are, it meant that people could be more wasteful with their bandwidth, if you might want to say that, and maybe use things like Modbus to, um, it, you know, to communicate their SCADA data um, and just trade off its simplicity um, for, for the, um, for that. So that's, that's kind of um, basically what we're getting at is uh, DMP3 is a true SCADA protocol. And if we were to look back at um, the Triangle Microworks videos, um, there was one slide that indicated the features of DMP that makes it a, a true SCADA protocol and clearly identified um, all the differences between, say, Modbus and, and DMP. And those were um, all identifying what makes DMP3 a true SCADA protocol. Essentially, um, DMP was designed to maximize the use of the available bandwidth and, and not be wasteful with it. And therefore, it allowed um, central offices to have a more true real-time picture of what was going on in the wired area network because they weren't spending um, extra time, if you will,
to gather the same amount of data, which uh, meant there was more latency in their data and they were getting less of a real-time picture, as well as it costing more to, um, to maintain those connections and so on um, back in the day. So when it comes to uh, DMP uh, um, and, and some of its features or advantages that we identified over Mod Modbus, one of them was more than one data type in a single request. That's not like Modbus. We know Modbus has a separate um, function code associated with a specific data type. Um, and every time you want to uh, retrieve uh, a new data type, you have to send another request. So when it comes to um, DMP, we can have more than one data type in a single request. Um, we can have something called event data, which is a recorded data value from a real-time point. And we know Modbus doesn't have that capability. If, if Modbus is going to detect an event, it's simply because it came around to polling that device again, retrieved data um, by basically asking for the same thing it just did on the previous poll and seeing that um, there was a new value or change of state. So that's the only way it records um, events is by seeing that a real-time value changed. And then lastly, uh, we say that it supports timestamp data. So what we'll see is if we look in the object library, there's an actual data type called time, and it takes that, um, that object or that time and attaches it to events and things like that in order to, um, in order to report that event and specifically and exactly what time um, that event occurred. So those are the primary three that we um, identify as what makes DMP3 a, a true SCADA protocol. The last one would be um, that DMP allows file transfer. And I wouldn't say this is, you know, in, in the top three, and that's why we don't generally list it. But um, when it comes to DMP, it will allow you to have a user-defined file that can move back and forth over a DMP network. That's even things like uh, small uh, video files that can be indicating site conditions based on, um, you know, um, outer... Uh, pictures of, of the outside looking for icing up on your equipment and or um, you know uh, activity in the compound doesn't matter um, but it allows user-defined file transfer so you could have a user-defined data type here sorry for the messy writing guys okay so that's essentially where we're we're going with all this guys and um, and here's just a, a snapshot of the um, of the breakout sheet, which, as we get to in particular uh, message structure, you're going to want to have this available for for reference. So I'm not going to spend uh, much time talking about these milestones. They were kind of gone. They they were kind of reviewed when it came to those triangle microworks slides. But I will point your attention to this guy right here. Um, DMP is an open source protocol, so it's essentially owned by the DMP users group. <clears throat> and you could, depending on who you are and whatever, you could register for that group and be part of the um, engineering team to change the protocol, to adjust the protocol, to do whatever. Um, but it is the, the number one resource for DMP. There's all sorts of documents and things like that that are available there and any question you ever wanted to answer about DMP um, could be found on that site and that includes some of the more extended documents that go into 
very specific data types and objects and how they're formatted byte by byte and bit by bit right down to the the bit level of every field or component in a message and um, one of those documents um, is a document that I have in my office and it's like a inch and a half thick binder describing each one of those data types and how it's formatted and in one of the courses that I was involved in we actually drilled down to that level of the messages and it was a really kind of <coughs> I guess, for lack of a better term, painful and and uh, time-consuming process. But all of the information is there should anyone want to do that. And it's a, the primary resource for anybody when it comes to um, answering any questions about DMP or finding more information about it. So that's dmp.org. Okay, so um, when it comes to uh, DMP3, it involves three layers of the OSI model. And um, when you look at the uh, DMP protocol and the fact that it's called DMP3, we, um, we're not really including the physical layer as a common layer for, for all protocols. So we have three layers, um, the data link layer, the transport layer, and the application layer. Um, but the application layer is the part of the message that's really looking at the function of the message, right? So this is really describing the functionality of the message and is it reading, writing, and then you get to the objects, uh, reading or writing, and in the objects are the data types. So. The object library is describing all our different data types. So the three layers then are that application layer, the transport layer, and the transport layer is um, referred to as the pseudo layer. And the reason it's called a pseudo layer is because it's in, in DMP messages that include all the way up to the application layer. Um, the transport layer is simply there to number the frames so that for a multi-framed message um, the receiving end will know how to assemble the message and which frame is the first frame and which frame is the last frame and how many frames are there in total for this one message. So that's why it's called a pseudo layer um, because it handles uh, multiple data link frames and each data link frame is a maximum of 255 usable bytes. So when I say usable bytes, um, it means that CRCs and, um, well, all CRCs and a, and a few other of the um, bytes within the message are not counted in that, uh, in that maximum value of 255 bytes. So that's why I said usable bytes. Okay, but the transport um, headers function or layer in the DMP message is to simply number those frames. And if you only have a single frame message, which in most cases uh, we have for DMP messages, then um, it's not, it's always there, but it, it's not used. So it's not, the, its functionality is not being leveraged. So that's why it's called a, a pseudo layer. Okay, so that would be the the transport layer right there. Um, now when it comes to the data link layer, this is the layer um, that's just above the physical layer that essentially is establishing the logical link between the uh, master and the outstation. So this is really entirely responsible for establishing the logical link. So if you have a master DMP and a slave, essentially the data link layer is just building that bridge or establishing that bridge by which you can move data back and forth between the two. 
and it, it establishes that on a session basis. So every time it, the master comes around to um, talking to that slave or that server, it uses the data link layer of the message to establish the logical link and then um, as the message carries on then it um, it moves data over that logical link now sometimes uh, DMP messages are just a data link layer message only because you can kind of think of it like a ping where there's just a message going out to say are you there and um, I'm just confirming that our logical link is still t still established so data link layer messages only can kind of be thought like a network ping to check on to make sure there's connectivity to the uh, to the other workstation or the other device and then lastly of course is where you have the physical layer and that physical layer can be RS-232 RS-485 Ethernet that's the layer by which the ones and zeros move back and forth between the the two devices so when it comes to uh, DMP3 data maps just like with Modbus we can have fixed data maps or we can have configurable configurable data maps so if we take an example the cell 501 relays in the lab they had fixed data maps every 501 had um, the same at Modbus addresses for every data type from one to the other to the other. Um, but some devices allow um, you to configure that and you could put Modbus coils on a certain set of addresses. You could put Modbus analogs on another set points or analog outputs or digital outputs. It's all configurable. And when it comes to the RTAC, which it was our RTUs that we looked at in the lab, they have a configurable database so you can configure it however you you choose as a as a engineer for that for that device. Um, so when it comes to a DMP device um, it can have any or all of the different data types found in your object library and when we look at your object library, remember binary inputs are uh, DIs, what we've been calling digital inputs. Binary outputs are what Modbus would call its coils or its DOs. And then, of course, you have your counters or accumulators. You have something called a frozen counter, which I'll explain later. And um, analog inputs, set points for analog outputs, and so on, right? So even though they ha these objects have different names um, in the data map, they're essentially all um, data types that you're familiar with, just uh, different names and, and other data types that have additional functionality like frozen data types or event data types. So when it comes to DMP, we know that these data types are called data objects and so you would expect them even though they have a different name to fall into all the categories that you're familiar with digital inputs digital outputs counters and accumulators analog inputs set points or analog outputs every one of the objects should fall into um, those data type categories that you are aware of now so um, when it comes to your object library, you could find any one of these objects in your object library based on the number. So you've got object 1, object 30, and so on. So if you were to look at your object library, you'd be able to look up object 1 as binary inputs, right? So if we look at our object library, look at how object 1 is what we see here, and it's called binary inputs and there's different variations or flavors if you will of binary inputs as object 1. The other one in the slides was object 30 so we can carry on through our object library until we find object 30 and now we find object 30 and we can see its analog inputs. 
and we have different variations or flavors of a analog input. So even though um, it's a, called an object and it's identified as object 30, we know that its data type is AI or analog input. And this is where you would use your object libraries in order to um, understand what a specific object group number means in terms of a data type. So the object variations then are indicating a um, different configuration for an overall data type. So if we were to take as an example object 1. Object 1 we said was um, a binary input which is a digital input. And there's um, three different variations. Well, there's actually only two different variations. Um, variation 1 and variation 2. When it comes to variation 1, that's a single bit value of a 0 or 1, just like we would see in a, a Modbus digital input, where there's only one bit for that specific point, and it's either indicating an off or an on status. When it comes to variation 2, though, this is where we have a digital input that's either 0 or 1, but it includes something called quality flags. And what that is is additional bits um, that are indicating things like whether the, it's online or, or offline, whether you can trust that, that point because it's online or offline. Um, whether there's been a, a restart or reboot of the device um, in between your poles and things like that. So um, we'll look at those quality flags and, and identify them a little bit later, the object library, <coughs> and look at those two variations. So notice how our variation one is indicating binary input without flags. This is a single bit point, right? So that'd be a single bit. When it comes to variation 2, what we see here, which is binary input with quality flags, then we would have a single bit status. Plus 7 quality bits. Whoops. 7 quality bits. Continuing on with this slide, we will um, take a look at this variation. It's something called variation zero. So we'll go to the object library and I'll show you what this, um, what variation zero is all about. Notice how it's saying any variation. So it doesn't matter what variation is listed in the object library, one through eight or whatever. Variation zero is saying any of those variations can be requested with a variation zero. And notice how here it says is used in master requests only. So, um, and it's called the, the wildcard request. So it's when the master is not essentially aware or wants to request an exact variation by variation number. Um, it'll just say, um, give me this data type with variation zero and what will happen is the um, request will come back with the specific variation. So what it means is the master sends out a variation zero and what comes back is a specific variation. So you'll never find a variation zero in a response because the outstation knows exactly what variation it has configured. But when the master sends out a variation zero, it's saying, give me essentially whatever you got. If we look at the object library, look at every single table in the object library includes a variation zero. So we can see variation zero here. Notice how it does not have any data type in the data type column. And that's because it's there. you can't identify it as a data type you can identify it as a um, wildcard request that is sent out by masters only um, to say, hey, you may have variation one or two, I don't know, but when I send out variation zero, 
you send back the specific variation that you're configured for. So it, let's say the, the um, outstation was configured for variation two, this guy right here. If the master sent out a variation zero in the request, it would be a binary object zero one, variation zero, saying give me whatever you have. And in turn, the response would come back from the, um, from the outstation with binary object, um, or sorry, object number one for binary inputs and variation two, because that's what it was configured for. So if we just carry down in the object library, look at you have variations at zero for every single um, data type, right? Now, when it comes to um, something like a binary output control, you're not gonna have a variation zero there. You've gotta be very specific about how you're gonna control something. So you're not gonna um, have a, a variation zero for a control request. So a control request will never have variation zero. So no variation zero for a control request, okay? So if you look at your counters, your running counters have variation zero, your frozen counters have variation zero, and so on. Any time you're doing any kind of a, a reading of a data type, it'll have a variation zero, and it's that wildcard request that the master sends out with its uh, message to say, give me whatever variation you have. What comes back is a very specific variation from, from the outstate. So that, that's what variation zero is all about. All right, so um, when we look at how this um, binary input data works, first of all, we're gonna look at something called the static data type. Now, when we're talking about static data, we need to understand that in DMP, static data is referring to real-time data. So anytime we see static, um, that's the name that DMP gives to real-time data, okay? So when we look at the static data point that we find in object group one, so these are all the static data types, object group one, then um, variation zero is for master requests only. So we know this is master requests only. Give me whatever you got. If we're talking about a variation one, of an object one, we're talking about this guy right here. And what is that? That is simply a status, a single bit, a zero or a one, just like in Modbus. So that's all we see here is a point that only requires a single bit. It's either zero or one. And in this case, with the switch open, we're saying that we have a real-time value, a static or real-time value of zero. If we look at a variation two though, notice how we still have the single bit status indicating in this case, the switch is off or open. And, um, but we have seven more bits and these seven more bits are statuses that are um, referring to or directly related to this point right here. So this is saying the actual status of the switch these other seven bits are referring to other statuses that are related to, to that single bit. Probably the most uh, important one is this guy right here, which is corresponding to this one, which is the online bit. So that's saying that you can trust that data. The, the loop is currently online, and that's a real time value of what's being um, measured or uh, monitored at that time. Now, there's other things that could have been a force value. That could have been a value that was essentially artificially um, simulated as a zero or a one, and those are called force values. And you can have remote force values, local force values, um, communications lost bit if the device has been restarted. This is examples of, um, of what these quality flags are indicating. So these are all 
quality flags they're called. Now, um, you're not required to define or know what, you, what each one of these are. You're just simply required to understand that each one of them is a quality flag and that a variation 2 requires 8 bits and a variation 1 only requires a single bit. And if you wanted to be able to define exactly what any of these um, points were, you know that you would just simply go to dmp.org and that would answer all those questions as to specifically what those quality flags do. Quick Google search is going to um, give you more details on that. For the purposes of our course, um, just know that um, what those are. You know, what is the, how would you explain those additional seven bits? Well, they're, they're quality flags indicating more than just the zero or one status of that point. Okay, so uh, like we referred, said a minute ago, um, when it comes to DMP's classification for, for data, it has an overall classification higher than even data types, a generalized um, data type. And the, the first one is the one that we called static data, is a generalized data type of all real-time data. And so when we're talking about, um, whenever we say static data, we mean the value of a current's value right now, its current value. Not something it was previously, but what it is right now, its real-time value. And um, it becomes an overall data type, whereas we have a specific um, data type in our object library that includes all of the real-time data. Okay, and we're gonna look at that in a minute, but that's all of the real-time data. And it becomes a very um, useful data type because you can ask a RTU or a remote location for that specific um, static data and you'll get everything that's uh, configured in the database. Well, then you have event data and another name for that would be historical data, something that's happened previously. And notice how it says any changes in the static data are stored separately as a separate um, group number is a separate data type. That overall general data type is called event data. So you've got static, which is our real time. You've got event data, which is our historical data. So if we now look at um, our, our uh, object one, th those binary inputs. Well, first of all, we know that object one indicates it's a static data type and object two indicates it's an event data type. So let's verify that. And let's go up to object one. And if we look at object one, we can see clearly that when it comes to our data type for object one, all of the variations are static, right? So what does that indicate? This is the real time value. Okay, so this is a real-time value for that object one. What do we see here? This is binary input events. So that means if any of these events change, or sorry, if any of these um, objects change, meaning the static objects change, then they create an event or a binary input event. It now becomes a new group number. The new group number for events is object two. Notice how there's three variations for that binary input change with time so that means that there was a time or sorry without time that means there's no time associated and we're just saying hey there was a change binary input change with time that means we've taken a time value from our time object and added it to the event or um, binary input change with something called relative time so what it just means is our representation of time in these two data types is just slightly different so, but ultimately what we're trying to point to is the fact that one of them is real time as static and the other is historical or event, something that happened previously. Okay, so <clears throat> what do we see when we look at this example? Well, we have our real time value of zero again for variation one. If this data type was configured for variation two, it would have the quality flags as well. So 
we would have not only the status, but the seven quality flags. If we look over here at our object two value, nothing has changed. This is the same value as what we started with, so there's no event. So right now, there is no object two data. Okay, now what we've had, we've had a change of state here, right? Change of state for this switch. It went from an open state to a closed state. What does that mean? Well, that means that our new real-time value will be showing a one, right? And you saw this um, many times with your doing your Modbus labs. You changed the state of one of the trainer switches. You went to read the real-time value. It changed to a one. What would that mean for a variation two? That would mean the status bit changed to a one, and we're still online here. Our our quality flags are still present and our online bit of a one is showing that we can trust that data. Now, what does that mean? There has been an event created. So because there's been an event created, we have some object two data now, right? Now, we know our object two data can come in the form of variation one. This is a um, indicating that there was an event with, without time. There's no time object at all associated with it. So it's just saying there was an event and it changed to one. If you look at variation two, what it's saying is we have a, an event recorded at a specific time. And believe it or not, um, there is still some milliseconds running from um, January 1st, 1970 that can be handled by six bytes of uh, counting milliseconds. So I can't remember, one student one time actually told me when that counter would run out, but I don't remember when it was. Um, but but this is uh, what, it, it, this is a, essentially a, a time that was associated as an object within DMP to start at January 1st, 1970 and, and count up for milliseconds. And, and so this would be essentially a, a synchronized time for anybody using variation two. They would say, oh, the timer started January 1st, 1970 and we're counting milliseconds from there as the total number of milliseconds represented by six bytes of data. So remember, six bytes of data is six times eight, so that's 48 bits of, um, of milliseconds. So if you look at, um, at variation three then, this is something called CTO. This is our uh, common time of occurrence. And what that is is a time that can be sent out over the network as a broadcast uh, message to essentially synchronize all the clocks within your network, all your RTUs are synchronized to that same CTO time. And what it means is that now will be an object um, that's added to events that comes from the object um, timetables um, that would be, be our CTO time. And once it's sent out, it would be the same CTO time across all devices. And this is variation three. So let's demonstrate what I was talking about. So first of all, if we're looking at our um, events here, we talked about our different variations within object two. One of them was without time. So that was the first one we looked at. The second one was with time. And remember that's w w referencing January 1, 1970 and the milliseconds that have passed since then um, and all the um, that's contained within six bytes of, of data. And then you've got your binary input change with relative time. When it's talking about relative time here, that's that CTO or common time of occurrence. So when we say common time of occurrence, it's a synchronized time across the network um, that everybody understands um, or relates to. You can think of it as time zero being set across your whole network. Thing is, um, it's it's often good to point out right now, where does that time come from? Well, it's an object or a data type within um, DNP, and it's a value that's uh, either written or, um, or added to a, um, to a specific data type, like an event like we just saw. Now remember, 
the, um, the variation three we just looked at was talking about CTO or common time of, of uh, occurrence. Notice how here, this is an object group 51 variation one or two that could be added to that variation three event because it was a CTO time, time and date, CTO time. So if we go back here, that relative time we said was CTO. Where does it get that? From object group 51 is where it gets that time from. Okay. So um, that's, that's what we're talking about when it comes to event data. We need to understand that event data is the result of a static data point changing or real-time point changing, then it creates a, um, an event. So when we have digital inputs, we've got object one as the real-time point or the static point. Object two is the event that's associated with object one. Okay, when it comes to digital outputs, um, this is what are, this would be like your uh, binary output status, would be like your read coil status in Modbus. Because remember, output data types are read write, input data types are read only. So when it comes to our output data type here, it's going to be read write. This is our reading of that. Um, of that coil, but it calls it a, a binary output. And then when it comes to writing it, it's called a control relay. So if we're going to write a value to a DO, this would be like your four single coil. So if you're doing like a four single coil, that would be an object 12. And then notice how for the object 12, you can essentially write a value with a select and operate, a direct operate, and a direct operate with no acknowledge. All of these are writing a value to that object, object 12, right? So output data types we know are gonna be read write. So there's gotta be the functionality of reading and writing. The read is the object 10. The writing is the object 12, and then you have different functions as to how you're going to write it. Are you going to do a select before operate, a direct operate, or a writing with no acknowledgement of your writing that data type? That's what that's all about. So when it comes to counters, um, you can have running counters, frozen counters, and counter events. So when it comes to um, object 20, and you should be looking at your object library as I, as I look at these, but how does it describe object 20? Well, if we look at object 20, what does it say? It's a running counter. That's the traditional counter like what you've um, looked at with, with Modbus. Every time there's a new count, it updates the count. It's a static data type. It's the real-time value in that counter. When it comes to object 21, this is something called a frozen counter. So, um, frozen data types are um, data types that were static values or real-time values that were essentially frozen at the time something happened. So um, if we were to look at, at our breakout sheet, we would see in the um, function of the application header, there is a function called freeze. So if you guys were to look at your breakout sheet and look at the application header, you would see a function called freeze. Now that function for freeze does exactly that. It, if it freezes a real time point when something happens so that it can be read later. So let's say as an example, um, you were uh, monitoring breaker trips and something happened somewhere else in your network and you wanted to know right at that time uh, how many times uh, a breaker had tripped. Well, you could freeze that real-time value, and then you'd read it as a frozen counter or a frozen data type, but it wouldn't be a, a running counter object anymore. It wouldn't be an object 20 anymore. It would now be an object 21. 